Hello everybody, Jack Powers, reading from my book entitled ADX Supermax, The Alcatraz of the Rockies. This is the first chapter. The Supermax Prison. The bus slows and makes a heavy turn into the Federal Correctional Complex in Florence, Colorado. It pauses at the guard station near the entrance before lumbering up a grade. On the left are what looks like college dormitories or condominiums, but is actually a low security camp. To the right, the Federal Correctional Institution, commonly called an FCI, appears. It has fences around it, but no guard towers. This is a medium security prison, and it is larger than the camp. The bus downshifts and shakes a bit as it continues uphill and around the curves. The prisoners look to the left where the United States Penitentiary sprawls out below the roadway. This is the maximum security institution that has a lot of razor wire, guard towers, and perimeter patrol trucks. But the bus keeps going up the hill, veers slightly to the right, and stops beside a giant guard tower made of concrete. Some of the prisoners move around in their seats. The bus has arrived at the administrative maximum facility, the Supermax. The guards take turns divesting themselves of their weapons and ammunition, and it seems there are a lot of them. The outer gate slides open and the bus crawls into a sally port area and shudders to a silence. The outer gate closes. The guards begin a methodical search of the bus. They open all of the storage hatches on the outside of the bus and look underneath it with mirrors affixed to long poles. They make a cursory look into every compartment and enter the bus to count the prisoners. The buildings are low to the ground and nondescript, prefabricated concrete with a faux brick laminate on the outer walls and no windows. The outer fences have a lot of razor wire between them and are obviously electrified. The perimeter patrols zip around in white pickup trucks. The inner gate finally opens. The bus driver hops in and starts the engine, releases the air brakes, and eases on through. There are numerous guards who walk beside the bus as it moves around the right side of the building at a snail's pace. Down the side of the building a ways, the pavement ends at what looks like a big garage door. That door opens slowly and the bus has to wait for the pneumatic security barriers to recede into the concrete before it can pull into the inside of that building. It is like a giant garage with nothing in it and the lighting is almost black. The bus pulls straight ahead and noses up to a spot where a boxcar type steel door is in close proximity. Prisoners are silent. There is a palpable tension in the air. There is another period of time spent in waiting before the boxcar door opens and a number of prison staff appear. They line up by the door of the bus, one holding a video camera. A burly lieutenant enters the bus and yells, Powers! John! Everyone is looking around to see who is getting off. I am slow to stand because of the chains and the fact that I cannot use my hands and arms. I shuffle forward down the aisle. There are prisoners on both sides, and they are looking at me. I stop near the gate at the front of the bus. The lieutenant tells me to recite my prison registration number, and I do that. Then I turn and face the other prisoners and tell them that I wish them all good luck. 
and to keep their spirits up. Some of them reply in kind. The lieutenant keys the gate and stares at me as I pass him and proceed down the steps. I am suddenly surrounded by the staff and walked inside the receiving and discharge area of the facility. I am immediately placed in a holding cell to the right and the guards remove the lock, belly chain, and the black box while I face the wall. They instruct me to remain there while they back out of the holding cell. They then remove the shackles, handcuffs through the bars and tell me to strip off all my clothing and put everything through the bars. I comply and soon find myself standing naked in front of strangers, one of whom is holding a video camera on me. Guard, all right, open your mouth. Wider, lift your upper lip. Now the lower, any dentures, braces or anything in your mouth? Powers, nope. Guard, fingers through your hair. Bend forward so I can see. All right, let me see behind your right ear. Now, put your left hand out like this. Wiggle your fingers. Turn your hands over. Palms up. Okay. Raise your arms over your head. Now, lift your dick. Lift your dick and nuts. All right. Turn around. Bend over and spread your cheeks. Bottom of your left foot. Wiggle the toes. On the right foot. Okay. Now, squat and cough. Powers. That doesn't work, you know. Guard, what's that? Powers, the old squat and cough thing. It doesn't work. You think if you have something inside your rectum and you squat and cough, it's going to fall out? Guard, it's policy. All you need to do is whatever I tell you to do. Powers, well, try it when you get home today. Stick something up your ass and then squat and cough and see if it comes out. I'll bet it won't. This exchange pisses them off and makes them suspect I am hiding something in my ass. They have a conference with the lieutenant at the desk, and he makes some phone calls. I am not trying to be a smartass. I am pointing out that this so-called procedure has no legitimate values in terms of security. I do not realize that the procedure is not really about security. It is about control. They want me to know that they are the ones who are calling the shots and that they can do pretty much anything they want to do, whether it makes sense or not. They have me dress in boxers, elastic waisted pants, and a pullover shirt, all tan in color. Then I am provided with a pair of white socks and a pair of blue boat shoes that I slip on. They handcuff me through the bars and put a square contraption called a black box over the chain between the handcuffs. This device covers the keyholes and makes it impossible for you to move your hands in any direction. They tell me to turn around and they apply the shackles to my ankles and double lock them. They make sure everyone is ready before unlocking the gate and telling me to back out slowly. They grab me and put my face to the wall while they put what is called a Martin chain around my waist. It connects to the black box and is secured with a heavy padlock. They proceed to take fingerprints, photographs, and swabs for their DNA database. It is like being booked at a, at a county jail. They stand all around with clubs in their hands, waiting for me to try them, like I could do anything at all with 50 pounds of chains and locks on me. They parade me through a set of electronically controlled steel doors, down a short corridor with mounted cameras at each end, and into the medical department. There is a big modern x-ray machine in the middle of the floor. Some weird looking dude with glasses and a lab coat makes sure I am positioned the way he wants, and then begins taking x-rays of me, chains and all. He takes so many x-rays, I begin to feel like one of the test champions. 
chimpanzees in the movie Project X. Finally, I am escorted out of the R&D area and down a long hallway. No one is talking. It is only the sound of keys jangling and squashy footsteps. There are two or three guards behind me, one who still has a video camera on me, and a couple on each side of me, including the lieutenant. The clubs they carry are about three feet long and have what looks like stainless steel balls embedded in the tip. They do not carry them carelessly either. They have them ready to strike. Their radios crackle every once in a while as we make our way along the wide but asymmetrical corridors. I cannot walk too well due to the metal cutting into my ankles and the short chain between the shackles. I am shuffling along at a snail's pace. We seem to be going deeper into the bowels of the building. We go through more barred gates down a slope, turn sharply to the right, and then go down a steep slope. I am numb in my mind and fatigued in my body. We come to a halt in front of a green boxcar door with the words, Control Unit, stenciled over it. The lieutenant speaks into his radio, and after a moment, the door slides open and clacks. We step inside a sally port area, and the other door slides closed with another clack. We wait again, and then the sally port door slides open, and we proceed down a short and narrow hallway inside the unit. Up ahead is an enclosed module they call the control bubble. There is a guard inside it, monitoring cameras and opening and closing doors from a panel of switches and lights. There are narrow gates on each side of the bubble. The one on the right opens as we get there and we walk through. We bear to the right and go up a short flight of steps through yet another gate and onto the upper range. The cells are on the right hand side of that range. On the left hand side, are indoor recreation areas that have nothing in them except a chin-up bar. There are big windows made of safety glass all the way down through the indoor recreation areas and, of course, surveillance cameras. About three quarters of the way down the range, one of the cell doors open. We pass cells on the right and I see prisoners in some of them, but some of the cells are darkened as well. Cells are there side by side in a row that goes straight to the end of the range. There are 13 cells all together. The cell fronts have a solid steel boxcar door with a food hatch built in and a fairly good sized window made of the same thick safety glass and backed by oversized vertical bars on the inside. My entourage pauses to direct me into cell number 208. There is a sally port just past the outer door. They tell me to turn around and walk backwards into the cell area when the sally port door opens. The guard with the video camera steps inside the sally port and keeps filming. Another guard begins to remove all the locks and chains in what must be some kind of a security sequence. He removes the black box and handcuffs last. They then back out of the sally port one by one and the cameraman finally finishes the filming of my arrival. The outer door closes and the locking mechanisms clank into place. Powers has arrived at the Alcatraz of the Rockies, as Federal Bureau of Prison staff refer to this impenetrable supermax prison. It is the day after Christmas and there is a lot of snow on the ground outside. My older brother and I both received new bicycles. We are excited to have them, but we cannot ride them because of the snow. I am not thinking too much about it and get wrapped up in doing other things. But when I go to find my brother, I see he is outside and has cleared a space in front of the porch and has my new bicycle turned upside down and has removed the wheels and is in the process of switching the wheels on his bike 
for mine. I run to tell mom and she goes out on the porch to yell at him. He does not stop. Though he knows that this is wrong, he ends up switching seats because he likes the one I got better than the one he's got. That's the first chapter of my book, ADX Supermax, The Alcatraz of the Rockies, by Jack Powers. It's on Amazon. I have other books. I have American Justice Correcting Its Flaws. I have the Manual Program for Personal Growth. And um, if you're into the... Uh, the Bible at all, or in any Christianity or religious uh, type programming, there's another book called uh, The Mind of Christ Program. Um, these are all available on Am Amazon.com, and I'd appreciate if you'd take a look at them. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of experience, a lot of stuff. I guess. Thanks.